misty and murky and some, if that happens, temperatures are really going to struggle. But with some sunshine, we should see temperatures generally close to average 7 to maybe 10 Celsius. We'll see a bit more of that patchy rain just crossing through the central belt of Scotland this evening. And then it stays fairly wet over the um, Highlands, Western Isles and the Northern Isles overnight. Some patchy rain, perhaps at times drifting into Northern England and things turn damp later in the night through the early hours across Northern Ireland. It'll be a milder night, particularly so across the north, but even further south, we could see some patchy fog and maybe a little bit of frost in rural areas, but generally temperatures holding up. More cloud then on Wednesday, certainly for Northern England initially and across the Midlands, Wales, a bit of rain early in the morning. That moves southwards and it'll bring the old spot of rain across East Anglia and the southeast as that clears through. Brighter but colder weather will arrive, but temperatures through the day should still, at least for a time, get up to double figures across the south. But colder air is arriving in the far north. Some wintry showers likely over the northern isles and the northeast of the mainlands could turn icy here on Wednesday night as temperatures start to plummet. And we will keep clear skies for many, so that will allow those temperatures to fall for Thursday morning. A cold day then on Thursday. Some snow showers across parts of eastern England are possible, but for most, a dry and a bright day, turning cloudier, but staying on the cold side into the weekend. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farrar, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. Well, over a drink, we have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrar's Dan Wooten, join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Gloria De Piero. Lots coming up today. Dominic Cummings has accused Boris Johnson of lying to Parliament about Partygate. And according to an exclusive poll for GB News, over two-thirds of you believe that's the case. Plus, I'll be joined by Conservative MP Siobhan Bailey. She announced her pregnancy in the House of Commons yesterday and she'll be telling me why we should be concerned about the declining number of midwives. And we'll focus on the rising cost of energy bills. But first, it's the news with Rosie Wright. Good afternoon. It's 12 o'clock. I'm Rosie Wright to get you up to date here on GB News. Now, the Deputy Prime Minister, Dominic Raab, says claims Boris Johnson lied to Parliament are nonsense. But the Prime Minister's former chief adviser, Dominic Cummings, said he was prepared to swear under oath that Boris Johnson lied to MPs when he said he'd not known beforehand about the Number 10 drinks party in May of 2020. Well, Labour's Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth, says Tory MPs are backing the Prime Minister due to personal interests rather than those in the national interest. The question for Conservative MPs is, why are they putting up with this? I'll tell you why they're putting up with this, because they're weighing up 
what they think is in their electoral interests, whether they should stick with this guy or get rid of him because of how that will impact on the next election. They should be making a decision in what is the national interest. Winston Churchill said country comes first, not political party. And Tory MPs should have that in their mind today. Well, in light of the party allegations, here at GB News, we've conducted an exclusive poll which reveals that over two-thirds of voters believe Boris Johnson has not told the truth about parties in Downing Street. 83% of Brits also believe the Prime Minister has clearly broken the government's own lockdown rules. And over 40% of voters no longer feel any obligation to obey lockdown restrictions if they were reintroduced. Now, in other news, huge crowds have gathered for the funeral of Ashling Murphy in County Offaly in Ireland. School children lined the streets holding instruments and holding photographs of the murdered primary school teacher. The Irish Taoiseach, Micheál Martin, and President Michael D. Higgins are both in attendance. The 23-year-old was killed whilst running alone along the Grand Canal in Tullamore. Magistrates will be given more sentencing powers in an attempt to reduce the backlog of criminal cases that built up during the pandemic. Magistrates will now be able to sentence more serious cases that would previously have gone to the Crown Courts, such as fraud, theft and assault. They'll also be able to give jail terms of up to a year, which is double the current maximum of six months. Some critics, though, have called it a sticking plaster solution. The House of Lords has voted against government plans to clamp down on noisy protests. Crossbench peer Lord Coville tabled an amendment to the new crime bill, arguing the original bill could prohibit large, peaceful and well-organised demonstrations from taking place. The amendment would ensure, for example, that there isn't a ban on loud protests in Parliament Square. Britain is supplying further self-defence weapons to Ukraine amid concerns over a possible Russian invasion. The UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says a number of personnel will also provide training to Ukrainian forces, but stressed British troops will not be deployed to fight Russians. Russia has amassed 100,000 soldiers, as well as tanks, rocket artillery and short-range ballistic missiles at the border with Ukraine. The number of employees on payroll has grown in December. Average pay, though, fell in November for the first time in more than a year. The Office for National Statistics says the number of UK employees rose by 0.6% in December to nearly 30 million people. Figures also revealed that in the three months up to November, the unemployment rate fell back to almost where it was pre-pandemic. Now, the BBC has criticised the government's choice to freeze the licence fee at £159 a year for the next two years. The Culture Secretary, Nadine Doris, says it will help families struggling with the cost of living. But the broadcaster branded the decision disappointing, saying it will lead to tough choices and that will impact the viewer experience. Experts in smell are suggesting that COVID infections might be making children fussy eaters. It's down to them potentially suffering from parasomia, which is a disorder where people experience strange and unpleasant smell distortions. Things like chocolate smelling like petrol and lemon smelling of rotten cabbage. Well, Sarah Oakley, executive director of Absent, told GB News, getting your smell back after catching a virus can take up to two years. You have had your sense of smell that attacked high up in, in the nose um, by a virus. Uh, COVID-19 is particularly good at this. Um, and it's, uh, it's um, destroyed some of those sensory neurons that carry the signals to our brain. Um, and those neurons, fortunately, are designed to grow back. But while they're growing back, things are a bit muddled. You are up to date now on GB News. We're on your TV online and DAB Plus Radio. I'll keep you up to date and bring you the news as it happens. Now the briefing with Gloria. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, Conservative MP Bob Seeley will be telling us about his parliamentary debate today on COVID-19 modelling. Plus, I'll be joined by Labour MP Tan Desi to discuss how to improve life for British workers. He has a parliamentary debate. And The Real Me, an exclusive interview with Kevin Brennan, Labour MP. Give me your political briefing, send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews.
former chief advisor to the Prime Minister, Dominic Cummings, has accused the Prime Minister of lying to Parliament about whether he knew about that Downing Street party during the first lockdown. Well, in an exclusive poll for GB News, over two-thirds of you believe Mr Johnson has not told the truth about parties in Downing Street. Meanwhile, a massive 83% of Brits believe he has clearly broken the government's own lockdown rules. And 44% of you feel no obligation to follow any further lockdown restrictions if they were introduced. Let's talk to our political correspondent, Tom Howard. Tom, make sense of it for us. Well, this underlines the enormous pressure that the Prime Minister is under, not least from his own side in Parliament, because what these numbers really represent isn't uh, a massive change in how people uh, who opposed Boris Johnson before feel. Lots of people who voted for the Labour Party, who voted Remain, have always felt that Boris Johnson is untrustworthy. What these numbers reveal is that Conservative voters are changing their minds. And about half of them have gone off the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister won in, a, in a, his, his enormous majority in 2019 with about 43-44% of the vote. Well, now those who wish, wish him to continue as Prime Minister is down to 23%. So a lot of those Conservative voters not turning to Labour, but turning to apathy and turning to thinking that this Prime Minister is not up to the job. Wow, those crucial voters. Tom Howard, thanks for telling us about them. Now, as COVID-19 made its way into our lives, so did transmission models. But was there an overemphasis on worst-case scenarios? In those models, Conservative MP Bob Seeley will be leading a debate in the House of Commons today. And he joins me now. Very good to see you, um, Bob Seeley. Uh, really interested in the debate that you're leading in Parliament today, and we're really pleased that you're joining us. Um, forgive me if I start by asking, though, about former top aide Dominic Cummings saying that he warned the Prime Minister the number 10 party invite broke the rules, claims the Prime Minister waved it aside and said he would swear his version of events under oath. The Prime Minister says it's not true. Who do you trust? Uh, I trust the Prime Minister. And to be honest, the problem with this debate, look, I'm not saying that Partygate is clearly a bit of a mess and needs to be cleaned up and the Prime Minister has apologised. Is it going to get one kid in school? No. Is it going to solve a war in Eastern, in, in Eastern Europe? No. Is it, going to get, is it going to bring COVID restrictions to an end? No. I, I, like most people in this place, I'm actually focused on stuff that I can help make a better Britain doing, getting people back in education, getting the businesses going again, and frankly, getting normal life happening again. This is going to be a really busy and important year, and this is a massive, massive distraction. And frankly, yeah, I'm not doubting that you know, things should have been done differently. I'm not pretending otherwise, but really there is a difference between stuff that's an important, that is important in people's lives and stuff that isn't. Thank you. Tell us about the parliamentary debate you're leading today. Uh, Gloria, look, I, I'm, I speak in favour of science because science is really, really important. But because the lockdown modelling has had such an extraordinary impact on our lives, and not just now, but in foot and mouth as well, um, we need to be questioning it. Does questioning it does not mean you're a lockdown sceptic. It does not mean you're against science. It does not mean you're a conspiracy theorist. But when you have modelling that says 5,000 deaths a day, and you know, mo median case scenarios of 3,000 deaths a day, and we're not even running at a 10th or even a 20th or a 30th of that, then we need to be seriously looking at modeling because it has such a profound impact on our society. And the important thing in this debate, I I'm not really gonna be personally attacking the modeling. I'm going to be quoting increasingly scientists who have become increasingly uncomfortable with modeling uh, with the flaws in the modelling, but also how that modelling has been presented. And it's not just about modelling, it's about how that's used by public health officials and how that's used by politicians as well. So it's a complex picture. Perhaps it's wrong to accuse the modellers of, of sort of exaggerating the threat. Perhaps it's the media. Perhaps the uh, nature of, of exaggerate and simplify, which is sort of, uh, you know, we do in the media, takes the worst case yeah. scenarios, the most sensational headlines. You're right. Sorry, Gloria, that was the one piece I left out. So it's a, it's about modellers. Um, modellers are getting it wrong, some of the time anyway, and certainly their worst case scenarios, and even their median cases, the average case scenarios. But then it's how that's interpreted by the media who are addicted to bad news, um, risk averse public health officials and frightened politicians who are also risk averse. Uh, and it is how it is almost the interplay of that. I'm going to be looking at the modelling because I'm going to be quoting a great deal from other scientists. And I try 
depending on how much time I, I've got in the debate, uh, I'm going to be quoting from up to 100 academics who've written peer-reviewed work and the stuff that they've written about the modelling. But there is, you're absolutely right, a more complex picture. It's about the, the way that modelling has been presented in the media, the way the government has said follow the science, when actually science was having this debate and we, we followed bits of the science and maybe the bits that we shouldn't necessarily have been following. So it is much more complex than just saying the modelers didn't forecast precisely, therefore the modelers are at fault. There is a problem with the modeling, uh, and I'm going to be quoting a lot of academics who try to explain why, but there's also a problem with how it's presented, how it's interpreted, and the willingness of the media just to say worst case scenarios are the norm. But effectively, during the crisis, we took what the army would say is the, the worst case scenario, um, most dangerous course of action, uh, when in fact we should have been looking at the most likely course of action. And I think that has driven a lot of mistakes. The government make projections or they uh, ask experts to make projections in all sorts of things. It, it's, it's not just uh, COVID, like the Office of Budget Responsibility, like climate change. Of course, they can't be precise because you can't account for things like a pandemic on the public finances or on human behaviour and how that might uh, affect climate change. It's tricky, isn't it? It is really tricky, but we still have a right to question it. If we have the right to question the politicians and we have the right to criticise the media, and, you know, thank God for The Spectator, for GB News, for The Telegraph, for The Daily Mail, because at least they've tried to keep a debate about this and try to question what government has been doing. And I wish more of the media had done that, frankly, including the BBC, which seemed to be uh, very sadly the propaganda arm of the lockdown state, when actually it should have taken a more sceptical view about some of the claims. So this is a complex issue. But again, I, I, I restate, Gloria, I'm re quoting from a lot of academics. I also think that we need a much bigger debate on this. I'm putting in at the end of this week for a three hour debate on the floor of the House, because there are many people who want to talk about this. And we can't forget the errors that have been made, but we also need to make sure that the government is planning ahead till next year, because, uh, sorry, later this year, because there will be another round of COVID come October, November, and we need to be looking at how to keep our society running when we have yet another iteration of COVID, which will sure as eggs be coming our way quite soon. And the way we do that is by taking things in our stride, by having a sense that the forecasting is accurate and balanced, and we're not just looking at worst case scenarios. But if you just look, if, if you just look at recent modelling, to do with the potential um, rising cases um, now in January and February, and those predictions that were made in December, even the best case scenarios uh, were were highly dubious, and and you know the the most likely scenarios were way out of line with what's actually happened. Bob Seeley, a pleasure to talk to you. And that's quite an impressive uh, sh shirt rack you've got behind you. Sorry, rack of shirts. Good to talk to you. Bob Seeley, the Conservative MP Thank for you. the Isle of Wight. Thank you. Now, a review commissioned by the government in 2016 made 53 recommendations for the government to improve working life for us all. What happened to that report? Joining me is Tan Desai, Labour MP for Slough, who is leading a debate on Parliament this week, asking that very question. Good to see you, Tan. Um, the review commissioned by the government called on the government to adopt the ambition that all work should be fair and decent with scope for fulfilment and development. It sounds lovely, doesn't it? How do you define fair and decent work? Thank you very much, Gloria. It's a pleasure to be interviewed by you once again. Uh, you're very right in terms of the overriding ambitions of the Taylor Review, and that was commissioned by the government itself because we all agreed that there was too much insecurity in terms of work, and that is why there needed to be these parameters set for fair and decent work with uh, the potential for that development uh, and fulfillment in all workers' lives so that everybody can have that safe, secure environment. Unfortunately, Gloria, what's happened is that since the uh, Taylor Review was published in 2017, so almost five years ago, uh, it was published, there were 53 recommendations, out of which 51 were actually accepted by the government themselves. But, and here's a big but, only seven have actually been legislated upon. So it seems that the government haven't actually got their heart in it. And that is why it falls on the rest of us, uh, the likes of myself, to make sure that uh, we hold these debates, to hold the government to account. So I'm very, very pleased that I was able to secure this deb debate 
on the Taylor Review uh, and to look at uh, modern working practices because everybody deserves fair and decent work and that means fair pay, fair treatment uh, and fair uh, conditions. The government's uh, pledged to make Britain the best place in the world's work. You're right, there's been a, a really long delay, but the business part departments say the government remains fully committed to toughening up the law to protect those in precarious employment. So let's be fair to them. There has been to a pan the pandemic. Uh, we just have to wait a bit longer for its implementation. Are you confident that it'll, it'll come eventually? Well, Gloria, how long do the good British people need to wait? How long do workers need to wait? And in all of this ensuing time, what has actually happened? The government has blocked a fire and rehire bill to ban that practice. Uh, that was debated ad nauseum within Parliament. However, the government, while giving all the sound bites and the slogans, they're very low on policy. And it's important that the Labour Party, uh, which has always been on the side of working people, that, that it, we must be on the side of working people. We need to make sure that we strengthen those terms and conditions uh, for people. And as the Living Wage Foundation themselves uh, have noted, that more than a million key workers are in insecure work. Uh, many people uh, li working within the gig economy uh, are, are unsure about w w where their next meal is going to come from, where their next, whether their wage packet will be sufficient. And as I said, many people haven't actually got any savings uh, either. So more and more people are now relying on food bank. All of these issues, along with the cost of living crisis, which has been precipitated by a whole series of measures, the decisions that the government took, which have led uh, to this very sorry state. Uh, and today we also learned that uh, the ONS, uh, the uh, Office for National Statistics, has noted that uh, wages have actually stagnated, that uh, because of the rising inflation, we uh, the, 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 the pay packets for people are, are actually uh, a real terms pay cut. Indeed. Does the minimum wage need to go up then? 100%. And that is why we within the Labour Party have advocated for an immediate increase in the national minimum wage uh, of at least £10. And the, the national living wage is also something that we need to review because that needs to be raised as well. Uh, along with other working practices, uh, whether it's uh, in terms of within social care, we need action on the s sleep hours so that, whether, uh, that those should be paid. And many people are having to go from place to place in terms of their travel time. And that is not being paid. Uh, so action needs to be taken on that as well. Uh, and the low pay commission itself needs to be reformed. So there, there are a plethora of issues that the trade union movement uh, is asking for and why parliamentarians like myself feel very strongly that look, we need to stand up for working people in this country uh, so that everybody can have that safety and security and that they can all have that ambition to have themselves and their children reaching the maximum possible heights. Tan Desi, Shadow Transport Minister and Labour MP for Slough. Pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. After the break, we'll be joined by a Conservative MP who wants to improve working conditions for midwives. She wants more midwives. Plus, she also has some personal good news to share with us. Before that, let's take a look at your weather. Hello again. Another dry day for the vast majority today. A mixture of clouds, sunshine, with some places staying misty with fog. And it's not dry everywhere. We do have some rain across Northern Ireland and Western Scotland, courtesy of this weather front. But it's bumping up against an area of high pressure, so it will be weakening as it crosses into Western Scotland. But it's bringing some wet weather through the morning and into the early afternoon across Northern Ireland for sure. And it will turn damp in Western Scotland during the afternoon. Elsewhere, most places dry, plenty of sunshine over northern England, parts of North Wales, East Anglia too, but there's patchy cloud across the south and some places not really getting rid of the overnight fog, staying quite misty and murky and some, if that happens, temperatures are really going to struggle, but with some sunshine, we should see temperatures generally close to average seven to maybe 10 Celsius. We'll see a bit more of that patchy rain just crossing through the central belt of Scotland this evening. And then it stays fairly wet over the um, Highlands, Western Isles and the Northern Isles overnight. Some patchy rain, perhaps at times drifting into 
northern England and things turn damp later in the night through the early hours across Northern Ireland. It'll be a milder night, particularly so across the north, but even further south, you could see some patchy fog and maybe a little bit of frost in rural areas, but generally temperatures holding up. More cloud then on Wednesday, certainly for Northern England initially and across the Midlands, Wales, a bit of rain early in the morning. That moves southwards and it'll bring the odd spot of rain across East Anglia and the southeast as that clears through. Brighter but colder weather will arrive, but temperatures through the day should still, at least for a time, get up to double figures across the south. But colder air is arriving in the far north. Some wintry showers likely over the Northern Isles and the northeast of the mainlands could turn icy here on Wednesday night as temperatures start to plummet. And we will keep clear skies for many, so that will allow those temperatures to fall for Thursday morning. A cold day then on Thursday. Some snow showers across parts of eastern England are possible, but for most, a dry and a bright day, turning cloudier, but staying on the cold side into the weekend. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Dan Wooten, join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. Welcome back. Last night, Conservative MP Siobhan Bailey led a parliamentary debate about the declining number of midwives. I'm happy to welcome Siobhan back to the show. Siobhan, it's lovely to see you. And let me start by congratulating you on your second pregnancy. How are you feeling? Thank you. Yeah, no, very good. I'm, I'm really well. I, I obviously need a wee all the time, want to eat the world, but otherwise completely fine. Have you decided whether you'll take your newborn into the House of Commons chamber with you? No, well, I echo's like I, 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 I didn't last time round, and 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 I just think um, it, it's for each MP to work out their own um, their own way of handling a, a new baby and their childcare arrangements. But for me, that that just didn't work. To be honest, when I had a little newborn, I just wanted to stare at her all the time. So we'll see what happens with this one. Um, so last night you led this debate in Parliament expressing your concern about the number of midwives in England having fallen year on year due to the mental anguish facing them. What do you mean by the mental anguish? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a real um, range of issues, actually. I, I, I was actually quite pleased to get the time to go through a number of the points through the huge amounts of briefings that I've been sent and comments from midwives. So the government last year uh, accepted that we were down sort of 1,900 uh, midwives, but since then there's been another fall of over 200. So we, we're, we're down now to 2,000 and we're seeing midwives uh, wanting to leave the profession all the time. The pandemic has had a huge effect on NHS 
NHS staff uh, uh, across all uh, disciplines, but for, for midwifery, um, there, there's been additional pressures. Uh, uh, we know um, with the restrictions, for example, that put uh, uh, that were put on uh, partners not being allowed uh, into the hospital, that uh, yeah, that's huge stress for for uh, expectant mothers uh, and and birthing partners. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, off the back of that, midwives seven out of ten of Royal College of Midwives members said that they they received abuse. So it's just been one thing after the other, ad additional paperwork. Unfortunately, in some uh, areas, there's been a culture of bullying uh, that's been highlighted and the, the, the lack of staff um, has exacerbated all of this. So I, I chose to focus the debate uh, on that issue. Now, critics would say your party is going into its 12th year in government. And if your party has wanted to halt the decline, they could have done. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, so the records are, are on workforce started in 2009. Um, so uh, for, for my research, I don't have the figures of when we were, when we had the, 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 the Labour government. But you know, this isn't actually just a government issue. This is a wider problem. And obviously, nobody uh, expected the pandemic. But I was definitely challenging the minister. The minister didn't have a, a lot of time to speak uh, yesterday, but she um, used the time to sort of go through some of the measures. I mean, they're trying to train over 3,000 uh, more uh, students and bring students in. They're we're looking to hire from abroad, for example. They're trying to recruit 1,200 midwives. And what I would say uh, and what many of the professionals would say is we've got to look at retention uh, and how we change those cultures, how we make it attractive uh, to stay in place, because at the, as it stands, um, we understand that there's over half of midwives actually in post now thinking about leaving. Uh, and I mean, these people literally hold new life in their hands and, and, and errors uh, in midwifery and maternity areas. I mean, as we all know, are completely devastating for families and will change uh, the, the, the direction of lives forevermore. So uh, for me, uh, there is a lot of things to focus on. And fix after the pandemic, giving us all a sudden shock. But I think this is certainly uh, an area that hasn't had enough focus before and, and definitely should have. And I, I was encouraged by the minister's point. She's also asked um, whether she could meet with midwives uh, so she could go through the uh, issues with them directly, which I thought was very positive. Um, you also pointed out in your debate that the government have made two important commitments. The first is to train 3,650 student midwives over four years, starting in 2019-20. The, the second is to employ an additional 1,200 midwives. Did we find out the progress on this? Did you get some answers uh, from min the minister last night? No, I, I didn't. Actually, I did pose some questions about sort of what the progress was. And actually, I just wanted numbers, you know, and mainly to give some confidence that there's a pipeline coming through for our midwives that are pretty stretched. Uh, they're not having blue breaks. They're not eating. They're, they're not they're not hydrating. So I wanted to give them confidence. I, did, I didn't get that. But that's possibly down to the uh, lack, of, lack of time. I had a lot of interventions. I mean, we had the uh, select committee chair, um, uh, Jeremy Hunt, came into the chamber, Andrea Ledson. We had Labour Party, uh, Northern our Northern Ireland colleagues came in. This was a, clearly an issue. So with all of that, it unfortunately uh, limited the time for the minister's response. But there are definitely questions to answer. And, and I, I think for, for, for people in hospitals and in maternity units at the moment, they do need to know that, that these students are coming through and want to stay. I mean, sadly, some of the surveys that we've uh, seen is that, 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 that some, uh, some of the people that want to leave the profession are people that have been in the NHS for, for under five years. So they're, they're the new blood coming through. And, and that's not good. But that cannot be only a government issue. You know, we're always hearing it should be more and more money to the government from the government to the NHS. But it, 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 that, that money is not going to fix this. There's a range of things. It's got to be the NHS, it's got to be the HR people within the NHS. It's got to be culture. It's got to be uh, our training facilities um, uh, and whether the bursaries, all that, all that kind of it all has to hang together. But I think looking for one scalp is, is not going to work here. And I, I hope I made those points quite clear last night. And Siobhan, uh, forgive me, but I must um, ask you about uh, the recent woes of your government. Six of your colleagues have publicly oh, called yeah. on the Prime Minister uh, to resign. Dozens more have spoken about the anger of their constituents. What's the mood in Stroud? 
Yeah, well, you wouldn't be doing your job if you if you didn't. I, I, I what do you say? I, I was so disheartened and let down by the stuff coming out of of, of number ten. I, I think if you love politics or just the love the politics of politics, this is obviously fantastic. And uh, but but for me, we, we're trying to get things done, and government and local government moves at Slayle's pace uh, in in normal times. So having this as as a focus is rightly that it should be uh, a focus because there are some huge huge questions to answer. Um, I, I'm pretty fed up, um, as are a, a lot of my constituents. And I, But I, what, I, what I do think is it's only natural that the big focus is on the Prime Minister. Um, you know, he's the big, big ticket. He's at the top of the tree. But there are hundreds of people in that building. And you will know from being an MP uh, that it's offices, it's, 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 it's function facilities. So I, I, I do think with all of that in mind that we've got to sort of wait, wait for this report. I think it's a natural stage to bring in more facts. Uh, but but every you know, as you can imagine, there's a there's a lot of discussions about it. I'm getting a lot of emails, um, uh, and it's uh, you know, I haven't heard an acceptable defence yet, and I haven't I haven't really got any acceptable explanation. So it's it's not easy um, for us uh, to to respond as definitively as people would like at the moment, in my view. OK, Siobhan Bailey, thank you very much indeed for that. Siobhan Bailey, Conservative MP for Stroud. Congratulations again on your second pregnancy. Thank you. After the break, we'll have a Life Stories interview with Kevin Brennan, MP. But first, the news with Rosie. Good afternoon, it's 12.32. I'm Rosie Wright to get you up to date here on GB News. The Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab has described claims that Boris Johnson lied to Parliament as nonsense. Boris Johnson's former chief adviser, though, Dominic Cummings, says he's prepared to swear under oath that the Prime Minister lied to MPs when he said he didn't know beforehand about the Number 10 Garden Party in May 2020. Well, GB News has carried out an exclusive poll to find out what British voters make of the fallout. It reveals over two-thirds of people believe Boris Johnson has not told the truth about parties in Downing Street. 83% of Brits also believe the Prime Minister has clearly broken the government's own lockdown rules. And over 40% of voters no longer feel any obligation to obey lockdown restrictions if they were reintroduced. Now, in other news, magistrates will be given more sentencing powers in an attempt to try to reduce the backlog of criminal cases that built up during the pandemic. They'll now be able to hear more serious cases such as fraud, theft and assault and give jail terms of up to a year, which is double the current maximum of six months. Huge crowds have gathered for the funeral of the primary school teacher Ashling Murphy in County Offaly in Ireland. Her pupils lined the streets holding instruments and photographs. The Irish Taoiseach Michal Martin and President D Michael D. Higgins are both in attendance. The 23-year-old was killed while running along the Grand Canal in Tullamore. A New Zealand Navy ship has departed for Tonga with aid on board. It's after an underwater volcano erupted and triggered a 10-metre tsunami on Saturday. New Zealand's military was unable to fly essential supplies to Tonga as the airport runway is currently covered in thick ash. You're up to date on GB News, but on your TV, online, DAB Plus Radio. I'll keep you up to date for the start of the afternoon. After the break, we'll be back to the briefing with Gloria. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. Well, over a drink, we have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage.
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. Welcome back. Now it's time for the latest in my series of special interviews with MPs where we go behind the politics and get to know the real person. Today is Labour MP Kevin Brennan, who talks about being at uni with William Hague, his musical band with other politicians, and new rules forcing male MPs to have to wear ties in Parliament. Do you think male MPs should have to wear ties in Parliament? Send in your views by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. I'd love to know what you think. Kevin Brennan, your mum was a dinner lady, your dad was a steel worker, you ended up doing PPE at Oxford. That's quite a journey. How did you make it? Well, it was, it was quite strange, actually, because I wasn't predicted to do that brilliantly at school when I did my A-levels. I went to a Catholic comprehensive school in Wales. Um, and my dad actually got me a job in the summer down at the steelworks when the results came out. And it was my turn to go to the canteen and get some sandwiches. And uh, I phoned up the school and they, they, they said, you've got you know, three A's in your A-levels. And I was hoping for a B and two C's, I think, or something like that, to get into university. And uh, I said, yeah, that's right, three A-levels, I'm doing three A-levels. I said, no, no, you've got three grade A's. So this actually happened. I went back to the gang. We were working out on site in the steelworks. And they said, how did you get on? And they said, well, they said I got three grade A's. And one of them said, you ought to go to Oxford. And that was the first time anybody had ever said that to me. And that's absolutely true. I was sort of, you know, 18 years old. And I thought to myself, well, why shouldn't I? If I've done that, you know, where I come from. So that's when I applied, after I'd left school. And, uh, and got in. So it was not the typical route, shall we say, for how it happens. And Oxford still, it's a lot of private school kids at Oxford, but when you went, it would have been pretty overwhelming. Yeah, the majority were from, uh, were from private schools. And uh, so it was culturally, you know, quite interesting. I did have, I think, temporary, they call it, there's a name for it these days, imposter syndrome, I suppose they call it these days. But I did for a kind of a short while think, did they get it wrong, my results, or you know, how did I get here and so on? But actually, I also had that thought, you know, if I could get here, then I deserve to be here. And you quickly find out that far from everybody being a genius that you might think coming from a working class background who goes to a university like that, actually, yes, there are 0.01% geniuses out there, but the rest of them are just clever kids. Some of them not so clever, but who got there, you know, because they've had a lot of the magic carpet ride in life. But um, so I pretty much felt quite quickly, I can do this, I can fit in here, and I ought to make the most of it while I'm here. When did you know that you were Labour? Well, I suppose when I was a teenager in school, I really started thinking a lot about politics. And actually, uh, I have to confess, I joined the Young Communist League when I was about 15, along with the anti-apartheid movement. There, it was sort of that awakening of, of, of politics and that sense of injustice inside you, something's not fair. And I think I, I, I realised that, you know, a lot needed to be done to make society fairer and to make the world a fairer place. And I was a typical, you know, teenager who, you know, spoke out a lot, had opinions, had something to say, probably not that well thought through sometimes, and that you ought to try and do something about it. So. Uh, I did that and then, you know, as I got a little bit older, I thought, well, how can you really change things? And that's when I got involved with and joined the Labour Party as a teenager. 
So we talked about your journey to Oxford. So not only are you going from your background to doing PPE, you then become president of the Oxford Union. Now, lots of our viewers, I mean, you know, frankly, most of my mates wouldn't know the significance of that. But that is something that future prime ministers go on to do. It's a very, very elite position mm. at Oxford. I've never been near the place, so tell me in your own words. <laughs> Well, I didn't. I didn't know much about it at the at the at the time where I went there. But there was a, you know, a big push. Say, come and see this place. And obviously, this is where you know very senior figures, politicians, came to speak, and they had debates. And I thought, well, this is you know, this is a place I should get involved in without really even thinking about the elitism of it. Um, but you're right. People dressed up in strange costumes, you know, in sort of white tie and black tie and things like that. Um, but that's not entirely alien if you come from a working class background. I mean, my dad never left the house to go to the club without putting a suit and tie on. So, you know, I, you know, I was used to that idea that you would dress for the occasion, you know. And, um, you know, I got, in, I got invited to speak there, actually, because I was involved in the Fabian Society. It's a sort of labour uh, organisation of ideas, you know, when I was in university. And being involved in that, I got invited to come and give a speech as a student speaker at the union. It was about private education, really, and and uh, you know I ranted on against private education, and Neil Kinnock was there from the Labour Party, and the headmaster of Eton was on the other side of the debate, and so it went down very well, and I got a good write-up in the student papers, and then a couple of people said to me, you know, you ought to run for office in the union, and I thought, well, someone like me, you know, so it's highly unlikely, but in fact, uh, you know. Um, I progressed through the, the system and ended up, so before me, um, someone viewers would know very well, William Hague was the president before me, uh, and then the term after him, um, I was elected to be president of the union, and it's basically the chair of this big prestigious um, sort of debating society where lots of people come to speak from all sorts of, all over the world, you know, presidents, prime ministers, all sorts of people. Did you know William Hague? I you did, yeah, no, I knew him quite well actually in, in university, and I got on okay with him, uh, we were from very different political viewpoints, but both of us at the time, I think, when I was there and he was there, it was the time when the SDP started to emerge, the Social Democratic Party, and you know, and, and I think both he and I thought that probably the best thing to do was to try and strangle that organisation at birth, so we had a kind of curious alliance, me from the Labour side, him from the Tory side, and so we actually politically always got on okay together and when I became an MP, he was already an MP at that time and a government minister and so on, um, you know, we sort of renewed that acquaintance. We're always on, you know, affable terms even though, even if we're on the other opposite sides of the political debate. Were you there with anyone else famous? Or, or your mates? Blimey. Uh, <laughs> I, um, well, some of my mates who are MPs were there at the same time as me. For example, the twin sisters Maria and Angela Eagle were contemporaries of mine and from similar kind of backgrounds yeah. really. Yeah. So we got on together, we were all involved in the Fabians, as I said, this group, and uh, and we were quite close mates when we were in university. So, was it William Hare that said that he used to be able to drink 14 pints or something, I can't remember, but that he was a big drinker? Well, I think, uh, <laughs> I think I'd be quite confident I could drink him under the table, let's put it that way. He, 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 he didn't mind, uh, you know, uh, having a pint or two, and you know, but but he was he was never a big drinker. I think that was a bit of bravado when he was leader, trying to uh, you know enhance his credentials with working class voters. But uh, he, his father actually ran a, a pop business, as in pop. you know, drink, yeah, 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 <laughs> pop, <laughs> fizzy, fizzy drinks, drinks and so on in, mm. in Yorkshire. And so he, he did, I think, work on his father's lorries in the summer holidays and things like that. But the, the rest of it, I think, is a bit of a legend. <laughs> Um, you go on to become a school teacher. Hmm. Any memorable pupils? Well, <laughs> yeah, actually, funnily enough, uh, uh, the, the, some of my pupils do turn up in all sorts of interesting places. One of them's a Conservative MP, which obviously means I was a hopeless teacher because she's ended <laughs> up, you know, on the other side in politics in the House of Commons. Nikki Aiken, who I think you've interviewed actually, uh, who's the yeah. uh, MP for the Westminster seat. Um, but I, I, you know, people, you know, ring you up from time to. I had a phone call when I, after I became an MP from one of my um, pupils. Her name was uh, is Estelle Wilkinson, and she rang me up and uh, and congratulated me. I said, "Oh, what are you doing these days, Estelle?" She said, "Oh, I, I'm, I work in the music industry." I said, "What do you do?" So I manage a band. I said, "What are they called?" She said, 
Coldplay, you know, and I said, oh, yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think I've heard of them. She said, I just want to say thanks for getting me my grade C in A-level economics, because that got me into university and I wouldn't have met the people, you know, that I met to, oh, uh, nice. so, you know, it was, it, was, it was lovely when that sort of thing happened. So you do bump into people in interesting places. Which leads us on to music. Mm, yes. <laughs> um, when, I know you're in a band now, you're in a band with other MPs, it's called MP4. Um, when did you realise you had musical talents? Well, I came from a, a half Irish, half Welsh household. Uh, my mother was born in Nantaglow in the Valleys, my father from West Cork. And we had a very musical household, you know. And my, my sister, my older sister, Nula, her birthday was on Christmas Day, so she got a guitar one year for, for, for her birthday. She really wanted to have a guitar, and I started picking that up. And my father was the sort of person who kind of turn up with stuff sometimes, and they were throwing a piano out of the local workingmen's club, I think, you know, at that time, probably replacing it with an organ or something. And he got, he got his mates to wheel it home, and so we had a piano in the front room. And we didn't have any formal lessons, but we, we played... And we did used to have gatherings at home and everybody would be expected to give a song or if you couldn't sing, to recite something. It was a very much, you know, kind of part of the culture uh, in our household. I thought, it was, I thought it was like that in every household. So, so at a young age, I started playing and singing and enjoying music. So I've always done that and written songs and been in groups and played in folk clubs and things like that. Uh, so when I came to Parliament, I didn't expect really to be that much involved in music. But then I met some other MPs who wanted a former a rock band and that's how MP4 came about. And you're from different parties at the SNP, we do, the yeah. Conservative Party. Yes, yeah, so the, the band, one of them is no longer an MP, Ian Causey was the Labour MP for Brig and Ghoul in Lincolnshire and uh, he lost his seat but we didn't throw him out of the band, we thought nice. he'd be a bit over the top. You know? <laughs> uh, and uh, Greg Knight who's a Tory MP, he's a drummer for, from East Yorkshire uh, and Pete Wishart who's the Scottish National Party MP for Perth North Perthshire. He was a bona fide, you know, rock star in that he played in a group called Run Rig for 18 years. They were on Top of the Pops. They, uh, there was a recent Sky Arts documentary about them. So, you know, there, there, was, there was a lot of competence there. But it came about because of a conversation, would be, we be the first generation of MPs that would have th those skills to be able to form a band? And we did. And we've done lots of stuff, particularly charitable stuff over the years. Has it helped you to be in a band with people from different parties? Is it good for politics? Has it helped you do politics better? Does it humanise each other rather than screaming at each other across the, the I, chamber? I actually think that sort of thing is important, as is um, having something outside of politics in your life. Because I think you, you know, some people are com just completely them, yeah. you know, dominated by politics. They have no hinterland. I think it helps you understand what people's concerns are and if you you know what their passions are and so on and it also helps you understand where other people are coming from in politics and sometimes you know to find better solutions for things other than shouting slogans at each other and you know the, the people in the band from different parties we would disagree vehemently on lots of things about politics uh, but I would describe them as friends nevertheless and I think it's possible I think it's really important for all of us, you know, that it's possible to be friends with people you disagree with. And I think politics has become quite toxic sometimes these days. Maybe it's the influence of social media in people shouting at each other from their phones. But um, the ability to actually listen with your ears rather than just your mouth, I think is quite an important skill in politics. Did you ever want to be a pop star, a rock star? Of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, did you ever try and be one? <laughs> well, no, when I was a teenager, I played in bands and things like that, but, uh, and, and half thought for, you know, of going off with some of my mates in a, in, a, in a van when we were in our teens, particularly when, you know, punk came about, when it seemed you could do it yourself. Were you into more. punk? Oh, yeah, very much so. I saw The Clash. Never saw the, 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 the Sex Pistols, although I'm quite friendly with one of the ex-Sex Pistols these days, a guy called Glenn Matlock, who used to play bass in the original lineup of the... Sex Pistols, but uh, I was very much into that. But I was also into things like folk music. I probably would have ended up in like the Pogues, you know, a combination of folk music and punk really would have been my ideal band to be part of. But, you know, when I did well in, in school and ended up going to university, I think that sort of, it, it, in my day, it wasn't, it was less heard of that you formed a band in university. You either went one way or the other, really, I think. 
So uh, that immediately set me down more of a political road, really, and that was the passion I pursued more directly as a career. Final question. So you said when you used to go to the Oxford Union, people got dressed up, very dressed up. You look smart today. <laughs> but I read that in July 2002, you appear in the parliamentary chamber without a tie. You said that tie wearing in the chamber gives a besuited image that's male, pale and stale. I read that the speaker asked you to leave the chamber because you weren't wearing a tie. And now look at you. Have you gone backwards or has Parliament gone forwards? And well, could you... The funny thing was, many years later, John Burko said it was OK not to wear a tie. But now we've gone back under Lindsay uh, Hoyle. Now he says, you know, we, he'd like you to wear a tie oh, again. Oh, I didn't know that. So, um, so that it's, it's gone back and forth, quite interestingly. Uh, to, to be honest, at the time, uh, I, was, I think I was just trying to grab a bit of attention. <laughs> so, so, so they used to have business questions every yes. week and you could raise anything. Yes. And I didn't have anything to raise. So I thought I'd, I'd do that. And uh, Robin <laughs> Cook, the late Robin Cook, yeah. sad you know with us, uh, sort of said, uh, no longer with us, said, said uh, well, I look forward to seeing what he's wearing next week. So the following week I did turn up without a tie as, as requested. And that was the outcome. So anyway, I've, I've learned the error of my ways. And do you get told, like, I can't remember because I'm not sure women... Well, I suppose we must have been told when I was an MP, we must have been told sort of formal dress, and I think maybe we know that's meant. But are you explicit? Are male MPs explicitly told you have to wear a tie? There was a missive issued last year that um, standards had slipped, I think by implication during John Burko's reign, but the excuse that was given was during the time when we had Zoom Parliament ah. for a while because of the pandemic, and that you know, and male MPs reminded they should wear jacket and tie and that uh, female MPs were reminded that they should dress smartly. Uh, I think it's a, there's a looser interpretation of that. But of course, you know, women get it in the neck so much in terms of what they wear, it's ridiculous. Nobody's, you know, if people are, uh, uh, listen to what they say, that's far more important. Although I have to say, my mother, who's still alive in her 90s, uh, you know, whenever she sees me on Parliament, the first thing she usually says is, you look nice. So that's why I've got a tie <laughs> yeah. on, really. Kevin Brennan, it's been a pleasure. Keep wearing that tie. Thank you. <laughs> I enjoyed that. I hope you did too. Now, I asked you if you think male MPs should have to wear ties in Parliament. Helen got in touch to say that she actually likes the ties up. Male presenters were here at GB News. Parker says that men should wear ties in Parliament and he believes that women shouldn't take their babies into the chamber. Linda emailed to say she does think men should wear ties in Parliament as it's about keeping up standards and women should dress smartly too. Ford says they definitely should wear a tie. I've complained on numerous occasions about that lack of dress standards in the House of Commons. Women are generally better dressed. Nella has emailed to say it's incumbent on all male MPs to wear a tie and business suit. It is disrespectful towards the electorate not to wear a tie. And Ronald said, yes, 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 bring back the tie. It's back, Ronald. You have been watching The Briefing with me, Gloria DiPiero. The show is back every weekday from noon. Up next, it's On The Money with Liam Halligan. But for now, it is time for your weather. Hello again. Another dry day for the vast majority today. A mixture of clouds, sunshine, with some places staying misty with fog. And it's not dry everywhere. We do have some rain across Northern Ireland and Western Scotland, courtesy of this weather front. But it's bumping up against an area of high pressure, so it will be weakening as it crosses into Western Scotland. But it's bringing some wet weather through the morning and into the early afternoon across Northern Ireland for sure. And it will turn down.